Simplify your federal agency's technology procurement with Connection Public Sector Solutions. Connection's dedicated account managers, commitment to exceptional customer service, and extensive catalog of federal contracts make IT purchases quick, easy, and affordable. Turn your challenges into opportunities and get rid of your technology pain points with Connection today. Learn more about what's possible with Connection Public Sector Solutions at connection.com slash fedcontracts. This is a CBC Podcast. Yesterday we were talking about food and how we as a culture think about it, how we divide food into two groups, good food, bad food. Professor Leah Potvan has made a study of why we do this. Her research includes areas of equity, diversity, and food justice. And she's here with us this afternoon talking about her work and, and how our society treats people who are deemed overweight. Sometimes it's remarkable what other people think they can say to people who are bigger. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it is. I'm uh, sorry, I have to chuckle because it's so it's so hard to see and hear. And I think the part of that that I find the most difficult um, as an educator and now as a parent is the way that people focus that ire onto children. Um, and because having, you know, looked into some of the literature, the school-based literature, uh, body weight is one of the number one categories that children are bullied for in school over time perpetually. And it's one, not the only, there are many forms, um, you know, that educators don't intervene on, but this is one that, that educators often don't intervene on uh, and sometimes perpetuate themselves. And, I think what's so hard for me about that as someone who has lived their life in a larger or a fat body and also is very into activity, a very active person, um, you know, the way in which the way in which we talk about bodies and access to activity and how that has, um, you know, sort of limited me even, even though I'm, I am an active and engaged person um, in movement that I enjoy, um, how that's limited me to feel comfortable to be in certain spaces over time, and I just that I, I that breaks my heart as a as an educator, as a community member, and um, you know as a parent that we adults have this bias that we enact on kids that ends up having <laughs> the opposite outcome we want. So we want our kids to be healthy, quote unquote, whatever that means, and active, and yet we create systems where they don't feel comfortable to access movement. And, and then what is the outcome of that, you know? The, um, the, I'm sure, though, that there are people listening right now who are saying, wait a second, though, um, this is a matter of self-discipline, if only you would. Um, there's probably also people who say, yes, but you can't possibly be healthy if you're that size. Sure, sure. I mean, I just think that that's, it's, <laughs> we weren't, we weren't all <laughs> created to look the same. There's always been body diversity throughout human history. Uh, can you go through periods where you restrict and control your body and, and want your body to look a certain way? Absolutely. Can you keep that up for your whole life? You can definitely try. But more than 98% of diets are not successful long term. And so, and then the, and the negative health outcomes of dieting and gaining weight and losing weight um, you know, are huge and they can affect you on a metabolic level. So, um, you know, we all, there are also people as a hobby who like, for example, get really into like bodybuilding. And so they do certain things and bodybuilders, I'm not stigmatizing you at all, but they engage in certain activities so that their body can look a certain way. And like, that is their choice, more power to them. Um, but I, but you know, the average person doesn't have to live their life in a state of restriction. Uh, the mental uh, anguish that comes from that alongside, you know, the negative health outcomes, um, you know, it's just, it's just not worth it, honestly. Are, are the two industries talking to each other, like the, the sociologists and the, and the, the sort of the, the fitness industry? Like, it, it seems there's a gap in this conversation yeah. somewhere. Yeah, I've been really heartened. So something that's interesting about this research, and I come to it, like I said, through my lived experience, but also through my work in food studies. And I was really interested in, like, are the food studies people and the fat studies people talking? <laughs> and um, a lot of this work comes from grassroots movements of people. And so it's coming from, you know, bloggers on the Internet. It's coming from people on uh, you know, social media. And so um, I would say that people are picking it up and are taking it up. And 
acknowledge, starting to acknowledge it and it's slow. Um, I just had a really interesting opportunity to collaborate with some folks. Um, Dr. Jennifer Brady is one and she's at Mount St. Consent and she is a critical dietitian, and so she does this work and also is a registered dietitian. Uh, and that's been a really, imp- along with some other folks, and that's been a really empowering partnership because, you know, here's a person who's trained in dietetics who is also supporting the notion that there is no such thing as, as good food or bad food. So I would say there is some uptake. Some of it is cynical. Some of it is driven by the fact that people know that they will make more money if they engage with a broader audience. But I do think, you know, this is one way in which, and it cuts in a few different ways, but this is one way in which the internet has been a a powerful tool because you can do online uh, nutritional counseling with someone who's not buying into a diet culture model. Um, And they don't necessarily have to be in your community. Um, You could just find them online and then engage with what they're doing online. In the meantime, we do have an internet culture now that celebrates um, the beauty of popular artists like Lizzo, for instance. What what do you suppose is happening there? I mean, I grew up, I was a teenager in the 90s. <laughs> and, uh, and so definitely, you know, body diversity and inclusion and fat liberation acceptance was not part of the conversation at all. Um, that was sort of like the second wave of the waif supermodel. Um, so, yeah, I think... I think it is this proliferation that stems, and again, the internet can be a wonderful place for good and it can be a terrible place, but I think people are just connected to ideas uh, and people and movements so much more. And there is this, as I said, like fat studies is coming out of this um, and body liberation is coming out of this grassroots movement. And then you have, you know, cultural leaders like Lizzo who get their fair share of criticism too, um, but are also incredibly celebrated. And I think there is, you know, this does speak to sort of the democratizing power of the Internet, uh, if we can harness it in the right way. As we've been talking, the image that's in my mind is a female image. And I mm-hmm. realize that that's sort of an unconscious bias. That's what I thought we were mm-hmm. talking about for the last six or seven minutes. But this is also a masculinity issue too, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it plays out in a in a similar and also a different way. I think... There are there is a way that both weight bias then intersects with sexism, and so it does affect women differently, uh, or women and and you know gender nonconforming people. Um, I think though there definitely is a, a different set of pressures for men to look and be in and uh, present themselves to the world in a certain way, and it's certainly tied to sort of being quite quite muscular and macho and all of that. So it certainly is applicable to people of all genders. And depending on where you see yourself in that, you know, the, it's, it's tied to those experiences. Though I would say for people who have other marginalized identities or identities where they might experience oppression, it, it cuts in a different way. It, is, there, is there race in this discussion too? Big time, yeah. So there's a lot of particularly black women and I would say um, American-based black women who are critiquing the way in which the mainstream has co-opted, the sort of mainstream and white um, audience has co-opted this notion of body positivity. And I've tried really hard not to use that term today because within this community that is actually quite a fraught term as well um, because body positivity, while in theory that sounds really good, has been taken up by a lot of, um, you know, well-intended but still negatively impactful uh, white women in thinner bodies. And a lot of the sort of scholars at the forefront of this are talking about the sort of the the racist roots of um, weight bias and the way in which this is tied to sort of in the past eugenics and slavery, which is inherently tied to the experience of black women. So this is a huge field (laughs) Um, and it absolutely, uh, you know, race is absolutely a part of it. Where would a researcher find the areas that need to be discussed, right? Like what's the big thing we don't know that we need to know? Oh, ooh, that's a really good question. Hmm. What is the big thing that we don't know that we need to know? 
I mean, I think we need, I think there's a growing body of empirical research tied to this. So a lot of times how this ar- these arguments play out is folks in the sort of sociology or social science realm having debates with people coming from what we would consider to be more like hard sciences or health sciences. And it's not always the case, but it's often the case that the type of research being done in the health sciences is, you know, statistics and, and num- number crunching. And then on the other side, um, it's sort of more about stories of people's lived experiences. And I, we, you and I both know the way in which statistics can be used and sort of weaponized. Um, so, okay, Lee, your story about your life experience is nice, but here's a longitudinal study about BMI, and this is, you know, <laughs> uh, the way in which that gets enacted. So I think the the more opportunity for those two schools to come together is really important. I think my the other piece that I would really like to see is a focus in on education and how we can educate particularly people in health fields about the negative impact of, you know, stigmatizing people with larger bodies in a doctor's office um, and, you know, in under health care, you know, when people are pregnant or whatever. I think that's maybe not an answer to your question, <laughs> but um, I think we just have to continue to have this conversation and be open to hearing what people have to say and be willing to dig into the uncomfortable uh, space that that might bring up for us. Well, it's been wonderful to talk to you today. Thank you so much for being with us. Oh, thank you. It's been really great. And that's Dr. Leah Potvin, who teaches at Lakehead University. Prior to her work there, she was a researcher at Cape Breton University and did a lot of work about the food system here on the island. For more CBC Podcasts, go to cbc.ca slash podcasts.